Sam, you have to back one player to take a penalty to save your life. Who you got? Eden Hazard. Eden Hazard. Eden Hazard. After this weekend. Cool as you like. Load it up, lock it in, light up the lamps and leave your limits on the landing, listeners. It's time for BR Football Ranks. Welcome, come on in, kick off your shoes and take a seat round the table as we take toll of the troubles, trials and tribulations of the torrential, tempestuous and as of this weekend, visibly violent vista that is the world of football, a world we simply can't get enough of. My name is Jack Collins and I'll be your map reader today, keeping your compass on track through this ever-changing landscape. With me, as always, are two men who know a thing or two about compasses. Firstly, a man who always knows whether transfers are going north or south and in what direction the rumour winds are flying. It's our ear to the ground, Dean Jones. Someone's going to tap you up soon and take us off us, mate. And a man whose popularity online suggests that he spent his school days being stabbed with compasses, the rank god himself, it's Sam Ty. Dean's was nicer than mine. <laughs> it Do it was. again. <laughs> Do it again. Do Go it again. again. Be nicer. We're back, loaded and ready. And with so much to talk about, let's get it. Dean, do you want to kick us off with hot takes? Let's talk about Gareth Bale's anger issues and the fact he needs to accept he will never fit in at Real Madrid. That last season, he was really angry. He um, left out the Champions League final and he reacted really well. He scored an overhead kick, which at most clubs would have written you down in history as a legend, a hero not at Real Madrid. Those fans have never taken to him and they never will. Now, this time around with Solari, again, he finds himself out of the team. He clearly thinks he should be playing. He's angry goal salutes against Atleti. Turns angry again against yeah. Levante. The truth is, no one likes Gareth Bale inside the dressing room. No one likes him in the stands of the Bernabeu. And Gareth Bale now needs to take the decision is it worth staying here in a place where clearly I'm not liked and not wanted? Um, Florentino Perez likes him and wants him, which is quite important. And he's also paid 350 grand a week after tax, which is very important and something he's definitely not going to turn his back on easily. But the idea of Bale at Real Madrid was supposed to be the future of the club. When Ronaldo left, that was supposed to be his time to shine. It's actually Benzema that's taken over. He stepped up a gear. Bale's time hasn't come. He needs to go. Dean, that's very mean. It is quite bad. But We've both been mean so far. Do you not think What's he needs bad? to leave? I think he should leave, yeah, because I... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I need, I need as many of my predictions to come true as possible from the first podcast. And if Bale leaves, or if Bale comes back to England, then I've got one in the bag. That's so you care I about absolutely agree with Dean. Everything he said is spot on. Bale, come home. Bale. Do you think that he will go this summer? Is it actually on, Dean? As I say, it's... It, really is going to depend on what offer he gets because those wages are significant and he's got a really good deal there. He's not going to walk away from that easy. So it's either what Real Madrid pay off some of that money, which probably unlikely, or it's going to take something like Man United come in and pay him that kind of money. Um, Chelsea, if they do get this transfer embargo, then that's another door that's going to close on him as well. So it's, it's a really tricky one, but I just think it's very strange for, for Bale because it's not really about performance now. It's just about the fact he's never going to fit in there. He's actually done pretty well overall for his time on the pitch. It's just, one, he hasn't spent enough time on that pitch. And secondly, the fans just don't see him as one of their own. Yeah. Sam, where does he fit in best? Is it at Man United or is it at you know, in a return to Tottenham? What, what kind of would suit Bale best in a return to the Premier League? Yeah, I think he can kind of fit in anywhere, to be honest with you. He's such a, a versatile kind of player um, because he's he's quick, he's strong, he's tall, he's skillful, like, he shoots well, he passes. Like, he pretty much does everything. So it's not a case of, like, oh, which systems would he fit into? Like, you could pretty much put him anywhere and he would find, he would h carve, a, carve himself out a role. I just worry that like he's going to have to take literally like a fifty percent pay cut to go anywhere, and this is this is this echoes what Dean's saying. Now. Right? And he's injury prone. He's so injury prone. So for any club to sit there and go, oh well, yeah, let's talk, let's talk in the region of three hundred grand a week or something like that, and, and maybe not mean that you lose so much money. They're putting a lot of trust in a guy who doesn't necessarily make it onto the pitch as much as he should for the for the cost that he that he basically attracts. But 
in terms of clubs, no one should be looking at looking at him and thinking, oh, he doesn't suit us, he doesn't fit us. Yeah. He fits everybody because he's so moldable and so versatile and, of course, so suited to the Premier League as we've seen already with Tottenham. Dean, we've seen one thing crop up time and time again this week and that is if Real Madrid offered Tottenham Hotspur 100 million plus bail for Harry Kane, would they take it? Hmm. That is probably as good an offer as they're ever going to get for Harry Kane. And yes, they probably should take that deal because eventually Harry Kane is going to have to leave anyway and he would end up going to another Premier League team, which is going to hurt Tottenham. So probably in their best interest to get him out of the country. So yeah, I'm saying they should take that deal. <laughs> yeah, good, good call. Yeah, good call. <laughs> right, well, I'm going to go second this week. And as ever, we went to the internet to decide what the burning questions that you wanted answers were. The three options this week in third place with a measly 17% of the vote. Could City win the quadruple? People don't care. In second <laughs> with 33%, what a dream Champions League final would be. Uh, but this week's winner and taking a whole 50% of the vote, the first time that anything Ooh. has got a majority in a three-way vote who should be Barcelona's next number nine given the apparent decline of a certain Luis Suarez I'm going to get on to what both of you think Dean what what feelers are out there and Sam who maybe fits them best but I'm going to put an early suggestion in here for Andre Silva ridiculed after a poor season at Milan found himself again at Sevilla and although a little bit of a drought recently nine goals in 23 games in La Liga is, is good his movement's excellent he's only 23 he was a huge part of that Sevilla resurgence earlier this season he just seems to be one of those people that still has the potential to be one of the best in the game where to be brought into a side with the attacking pedigree that Barcelona have. And he's been dovetailing nicely with Ben Yedda and with Sarabia. And I think that kind of unselfish nature of his game would suit Barcelona. Yeah, I don't mind that as a shout. Andre Silva, a bit of a bounce back season for Sevilla. That player we saw at Milan, definitely not him. Though I have got five names prepared for this and he's not one of them. So I'll he has go a major th- cut. I'll go through them. Yeah, I've ranked them. Classic. Um, at five, Luka Jovic on loan from Benfica at Frankfurt. Yeah. So starring in the Europa League and starring in the Bundesliga. Really good player, two-footed finisher. Not the strongest or the most mobile player in the world, but just an absolutely deadly player in the box. Mauro Icardi, if things can't be repaired at Inter Milan, Mm. arguably the best finisher in world football. Surely going to be available. Yeah, might just be available. I think in a Barca side that creates a lot of chances, he's a good shout. Then we start to go a little bit more rogue, I think. Gabriel Jesus, if Aguero's never slowing down, cheeky bid for Jesus. Surely Aguero is going to slow down at some point. All the evidence suggests he's not. Okay, (laughs) He carries on going. He keeps going. Jesus, a little, like, he'd be so good for Barcelona. He'd suit them down to the ground. As would Son Hyun Min Mm. from Tottenham. That's a really good show. I mean, what what a year it's been for him. With anyone, let's do it. Yeah, get on with it. We're linking him now. I'm going to do an article today. And then top of the list, which is pie in the sky, but like, Everyone wants a Bappe, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. And if you if you do re- if you really are insistent on on basically replacing someone like Suarez, who is an elite tier striker with a fellow elite tier striker, your options are extremely limited. And I, I do get the feeling that someone like Lewandowski may not actually suit Barca as well as someone like Mbappe. Yeah. Of course, everyone knows that this would cost about five hundred million euros. So, how much money have you got? Dean, who are they actually linked with? I suppose <laughs> of those players. <laughs> <laughs> well. Jovic is the one, to be honest, and I, I spoke to a few people coming into this podcast um, at Barcelona and sources around there, journalists and stuff, and Jovic is the one that everyone seems to think is the closest fit to Suarez in terms of, like Sam says, the clinical finishing, but also the determination and the off-the-ball movement. His, his movement's unbelievable. Um, and he works. He really works his socks off. I mean... Probably not got maybe the street fighter that, that Suarez has got, but it's not far off it and is as close as you're going to find a fit to him if you're looking for that like for like. Barca are genuinely interested in him. Real Madrid have kind of made sounds as well as that they might get interested, but it seems to me that Barca are going to try and do this. But what's the situation with Jovic? Because he's, he's actually on loan at Frankfurt for It's two a really years. weird one. I mean, Benfica have let him go out on a two-year loan to Frankfurt and to make that deal permanent in the summer, which they are going to do. Um, it's going to cost them five to six million pounds, depends how it converts. But somewhere in that region, they're going to buy Jovic. Then they are probably going to sell him immediately for somewhere around 40 million, possibly as high as 50 million pounds. Now, that's an unbelievable piece of business yeah. for everyone involved. Um, apart from apart Benfica. Benfica. Yeah, come on, Benfica. Yeah. What are you doing, guys? They, yeah. They've got some issues at the moment with forwards out on loan as they've also got Raul Jimenez on loan at Wolves banging in goals. But um, 
you know, at the moment... can't score for, for love nor money themselves, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, look, Messi is carrying Barcelona at the moment like probably never before. And I think that having Jovic in there would really, really help him. So, yeah. <laughs> Interesting that Piontek hasn't been brought up. Obviously, we've discussed well, we him a lot. Podcast, we do have to so discuss him well. in every podcast. He's just moved, though, to Milan. So you'd imagine that this summer is too late and, and Barcelona really do seem like they need someone this summer. Yeah, I would I would guess so. The thing yeah. with Suarez is we, we've all sort of... We, we're having this conversation. It's as if we completely have dismissed Luis Suarez. He's in a bad patch. He's had him before. He often follows two months of rubbish with two months of absolute brilliance. True. So it's about whether or not he can peak at the right time for Barcelona to get over the line in the Champions League. We're not sitting here saying that Luis Suarez is finished, that no, he's rubbish no. and that he's leaving. It's just that at his age now and with the peaks and troughs that he experiences, Barca really need to get themselves in gear and find themselves a long-term successor because they can only manage this situation for so long by just overworking Messi to the point where the guy just needs a break. All right, Sam, it's on for your hot take. And uh, I know this is something that's been a, a key talking point in the world of football. Yeah, it has. Yeah, it's uh, it's on the Kepa, Aritza Balaga and Maurizio Sarri situation. Ooh. So for, for those of you that, that don't know, I guess I'll very briefly explain it. About a couple of minutes away from penalties on Sunday in the Carabao Cup final, locked at nil-nil. Uh, Kepa's already gone down with cramp twice. It looks like he's injured. Chelsea have got one more sub available. So Maurizio Sarri, perhaps sensibly, asks his reserve goalkeeper to warm up and put his gloves on. Kepa's gone down twice already. So Caballero gets his gloves on, stands by the subs board. The numbers go up. Kepa's name is called. Kepa says, no, I'm not coming off. <laughs> Absolutely not. He stands in the middle of the pitch, about 30 or 40 yards away from his manager and from the bench. Doesn't even look at him. It doesn't even look at him and just wags his finger at him and starts shouting, no, 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 no. And just like ma making signals towards the bench as if to say, F off, basically. Yeah. It's basically what he's saying. Sarri blows his lid and literally nearly walks out on his own job. He was two he, yards from walking out on his own he's job. Walking, he's about to walk down the tunnel and there's a door there with, with with signage on it and he gets within about two steps of it and goes, if I leave this pitch, no coming back. <laughs> I'm out. Like I've literally, uh, this is my resignation walk. So he turns around, sits down. He's still furious. Chelsea lose on penalties. Kepa not helped by the fact that he lets a really weak Aguero penalty really under his body. Weak, really like, that, doesn't, that doesn't really help him at all. But of course, the focus then turns to, you know, Kepa, open, open defiance and disobeying his manager. Sarri, is he weak? Has he lost the dressing room? It was all looking really, really bad for Sarri at that point. But I was sat watching the game and I was sat in the press conference after the game. And I have a lot of admiration for Sarri about how he dealt with this. And I actually think he boosted his own stock and came out of this day looking better than he did before, somehow. And it's because he dealt with the situation superbly. He basically sat there and thought, right, how the hell am I going to explain this? And he very carefully did not take Kepper on publicly because he would have then entered a battle that Mourinho entered with Pogba and other managers have entered with other players. And he would have lost. Like Sarri coming into that game, job on a string. Mm. If he'd have taken on the world record goalkeeper, his £72 million keeper, he would have lost. He would have been fired. It's notable that some of you won't know this, but in press conferences after a final, generally the losing manager comes in to speak to the media first because usually the winning manager is celebrating and speaking to his mm -hmm. players and doing extra TV work. Pep Guardiola actually came in first. And then Sarri came in about 15 minutes after Pep had left. So probably about... 26 cigarettes in that time. <laughs> <laughs> probably that's under, undercutting it yeah. by some distance, if I'm honest. Probably about 50 minutes to an hour after the final whistle, Sarri came in. And he'd obviously sat down and thought, how am I going to explain this? And he passed it off as a big misunderstanding, said Kepa was right to stay on if he wasn't injured, said he was wrong in the way that he addressed the bench and addressed Sarri. But ultimately, if he's, if he's not injured carry on because he was only ever going to bring Caballero on for an injury. He was never thinking about bringing him on to save penalties a la Tim Krull at the World Cup for, for the Netherlands. Good, Dean disagrees. Good work, good work Sarri. Yeah, good agreed. work. Dean disagrees with this and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it to him because I know that there's an, a massive rebuttal coming from I've the other side. I've got a few issues with this. Okay, so Sarri has already taken on his players before. He did it a few weeks ago, called out the whole team. Yeah, so, so he just did, decided not to do that again. Yeah, and we so just, should have gone on, back down on there, that right? point, in fairness, he was criticised heavily for doing that and therefore decided to learn from that and, and change his ways. I think that's something to recommend a manager for, to, to commend him for. No, because this time he should have done it. <laughs> <laughs> when he did do it, it was not advisable. This time he should have done it and he didn't do it. Um, 
he's probably going to get sacked anyway, so it's, it wouldn't be worrying about things like that at this stage. People have more respect for you if you actually come and stand up for yourself because he just kind of looks completely undermined in that situation. My other massive issue with this is the behaviour of Kepa. Yeah, okay? fine, yeah. So he goes down twice. He, let's remember, he was an, a doubt for the cup final with a hamstring injury. He's down on the floor holding his hamstring twice and he's saying it's cramp. How can he have cramp? He's goalkeeper. He's been walking around his box for 120 minutes. You don't get cramp from doing that. It wasn't that hot. I've seen Jack get cramp from that. He had yeah, a few sips know. of water. You're sorted out. So he's faking that injury. So he's just going, he's gone down twice, basically probably to waste time to get to a penalty shootout, which suddenly realises he might not be part of. <laughs> <laughs> so he just decides to pretend that none of this is going on around him, gets tunnel vision, ignores everybody and thinks it'll blow over. I'll win this. I'm Kepa. The conduct of Kepa is deplorable in this instance. It is. And he's been fined, right? So you He's can, been fined. So clearly he did something wrong. You clearly see the club think that he has, he has misbehaved. The defiance of Sarri, the way he motions towards him, the way he refused to look at him, the way he didn't go to the touchline and say to Sarri, hey, it's cool. I'm not injured. I'll be okay for two minutes and then I'll save some penalties. Just walk 30 yards and speak to your manager. But it can't be a misunderstanding if you are then fining him a week's wages. That Chelsea's message is so confusing on the back of this. And it's because nobody's known how to deal with this kind of emergency that they've come across. So I saw a tweet from Bleacher Report's own Alex McGovern, Chelsea fan, journalist. He said he knows the Kepa situation will be blown up and shown as Sarri losing the dressing room. But there's a fair chance it's nothing more than an emotional young keeper desperate not to go off so he can be the hero and win his first senior trophy. To clarify, not saying that's acceptable. What I'm saying is that the narrative will be... The, the players have no respect for Sarri when it might just be that the emotions and the situation got the better of a young keeper in his first major final. I think that's a reasonably acceptable way to look at it. Yes, obviously there are bad things to Kepa and he's been fined a week's wages, but this doesn't necessarily mean that Sarri's lost the dressing room or, or any of those things that seem to be massively blown out proportion in the kind of retrospective look back at something like this. And you know, there's so much of it. There's like, oh, everyone's desperate for there to be so much scandal that maybe it's just a mistake from Kepper and Sarri has backed his player publicly and that suggests that there's maybe more respect between the two of them than there was in the first place. Well, that's the thing. I praise I praise Sarri's self-preservation instincts in this regard. Like, he's just tried to brush it under the carpet as much as possible. And I say self-preservation instincts despite the fact that he smokes 50 a day. But, Jack, <laughs> Good, yeah, a, Jack yeah. a point that you've, you've made to me as well it, is that... Where was the club captain in all of this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why wasn't he trying to defuse the situation? What so, uh, Native Spanish speaker Cesar Azpilicueta can't walk over to fellow Spanish speaker Kepa and say, dude, walk over to the touchline and tell Sarri that you're fine. Like, don't stand in the middle of the penalty box waving at him and dismissing but him. But Sarri would already have known the situation because the medics had been on the pitch. I know he's saying, I didn't find out until later what the medical staff had seen. He'd, they'd already been on once. You always get told what the issue was. The lack of the leadership in, in the Chelsea dressing room has been an issue for ages, though. And as Aquetta doesn't seem to have that leadership ability. You know, there are rumours floating that he had to ask David Luiz which end they should shoot into for penalties, whether they should go first or second. All of that was floating around. How does a rumour like that start? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, David Luiz probably leaked it, if I'm honest. You know, let's, let's be... But look, there, there's a massive like show there of a, a lack of leadership ability and that's what's hamstringing Chelsea in so many ways right now. I think that's why the fans are all, you know, suggesting that someone like Frank Lampard or someone like John Terry gets involved at management level. That's why those names are in the frame for potential management, uh, you know, managerial changes because they they yearn for that that leadership instinct and that yep. ability to harness a dressing I'm room. I'm convinced even more so after seeing that cup final, Frank Lampard will be Chelsea manager in the summer. OK, well, there's another shout from famously good at predictions, Dean Jones. <laughs> well, penalties have been high up the agenda this week. Contentious ones for Fiorentina and Real Madrid, as well as the obvious shootout drama in the League Cup final. And with the looming spectre of more shootouts in the Champions League next week, we thought it'd be good to get a penalty expert onto the show to help us with our main rankings. So we'll be back with all sorts of penalty chat and an interview with former Spain, Barcelona and Valencia midfielder and one of the greatest penalty takers of all time, guys, Comendieta after the break. 
Welcome back to Be Our Football Ranks, where we're talking penalties and penalty shootouts. Last week, Dean and I went to meet Guys Mendieta, who took 30 penalties in his football career, missing only one, which makes him somewhat of a legend from 12 yards. We started off by asking him which players he'd have taking the spot kicks if his life depended on it, and he wasn't allowed to include himself. It's hard to pick them because um, straight away comes to my head Messi, but Messi is not the greatest on penalties. Like, um, uh, same... Uh, with Ronaldo, he's not the most reliable, although he's a bit more reliable than Messi. It is in, in, uh, from the from the penalty spot. Uh, so let's get into it. For me, first one or number five, I'll go with uh, Ibrahimovic. I think uh, not only the number of, of, of percentage that he's the score rating and the way he's taking them, in the moments he's taking them, in, uh, makes him very reliable. Uh, so I'll put my life for him and on, on penalty, not on the rest. <laughs> yeah, the rest of it will be a little bit <laughs> dangerous. Like myself. <laughs> um, another one, number four, could be... Um, I think I'll go for Xavi Alonso. Okay, uh, yeah. Could probably be number one or two or three. He is reliable. Uh, he is yeah. reliable. And again, when I, when I consider one of the penalty takers, not only on the percentages, but I think also in the, in the moments they've been taken, and, and the, the number of penalties and the number of the, of the chances they've been taken in under high pressure. And I think Xavi is one of them that you can actually rely on him. Uh, another one, number three, I'm going to go Ronaldinho. I'm not sure about the percentage, but I, I can remember a lot of them being scored. <laughs> The quality that he has, that keeping capable of saying, okay, I put the ball top corner or whatever he wants to put it, he's got the, the ability to do so. So that would be Ronaldinho on the penalty spot. I think that one would be risky. Huh? You think it's risky? He might do something silly. Yeah, he might try and be super. He's a dangerous person. I mean, in a friendly game, yes, yeah, so he could do like <laughs> back heel or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> on a Champions League final. A back heel panenka or something. <laughs> well, that would be Thierry and Rim, maybe, and uh, invincible, yeah. but yeah, no, I don't think. Uh, Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, another one that's two to go. Robin. Robin, I think, is uh, the quality again, power, technique. Um, I'm definitely caught in my last one. I'm gonna go. He's not taking many, but the ones he's taking, he's been like huge penalties, uh, and he does Fabregas. Uh, okay. Yeah, he's not again. He's not a regular on the penalty spot, but Spain, Chelsea, Barca, uh, semi-finals, finals, um, knockout. He's been unbelievably reliable. So yeah. I put my life on his on his boots. You said Zlatan. Yeah, yeah, Zlatan. You, you ended with Fabregas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were to look at an order of a penalty. Would you go Zlatan first, Fabregas last, or would you go Fabregas first, Zlatan last? Do you think it matters which order they go in? I when think it does matter. And we, well, in my teams or in the national team, we always done it in a similar way. So you have the two best penalty takers or the most reliable penalty takers, one first and one last. Yeah. So that means you start with the confidence of scoring. And you have the best one in case you need to, or whatever reason, someone needs to score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to score. So the way I would do it, I would put Cesc first because he's reliable, although he's not taking many. And I put Zlatan because he's got more experience in the last. Also because the time you got to think through the penalty take uh, knockouts, is, I mean, th those minutes looks like ages. Yeah, but it's like an so hour. So it gives you like time to think, oh, I take it like this. And then someone kicks it like the wall you thought you were going to kick it and miss it. And they're like, oh, no, I take it like that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you need yeah. some, someone that is really confident within the way he's going to take it. You so think that sounds confident? No, I think. Just <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't you think we'll take one second. I'm going to put it up corner and stay that way. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to ask you in a minute about yeah. the goalkeeper you'd have in the same situation, a okay. uh, penalty saving goalkeeper. But just before we do that, there's been kind of a lot of talk recently mm. about the art of taking penalties and, and kind of run-ups and all those things. Yeah. And, and we've seen a lot of discussion around Paul Pogba's run-up yeah. uh, and also Aritza Duri's after that one-step yeah. run-up that yeah, he, he yeah. did last week or the week before um what's i mean i suppose the, the how do they how do different players change their run-up and what's the kind of style well i mean what was your style and, and yeah. how does that affect you as a penalty taker if you can't do the run-up that you're looking to do okay i like you call it the art of taking penalties because i hate the the, the, the the denomination of oh it's penalty knockout it's about luck no i think nowadays most people know is there's no it's luck behind it because it's a sport 
but there's a lot of study behind it as well uh, and practice. For me, the, the most important thing when you come to check the penalty, it's, it's obviously confident. If you, for one second, doubting, oh, this goalkeeper might save it, or might kick it out, or might do, just the fact that you're thinking of a might, that's a big blow for, for the, the, the way you're going to take that penalty. Mm -hmm. You're giving already chances to the goalkeeper to save. So confidence, for me, is key. Then, taking that confidence could be in, in, in both ways for me. One is obviously, there's the penalty takers that are always taken in the same way. So it goes, I go right, I go left, I go up, I go down. So that confidence gives you that, the, the momentum of saying, even before you put the ball on the spot, thinking that's the way I'm going to take it. And that's one way, which I think is the more traditional one. And now maybe the more Ramos way, the more um, sort of improvising, Improvising doesn't mean improvisation because yes. before he's taking the penalty, he knows what he's going to do, it, which I think, again, that, that's key in the terms of the confidence. He, before he takes a panenka, he knows today I'm going from panenka and I'm going this way. Um, so that, that's a different style. Uh, with the best one, I think the best penalty is the best one that he hit the net. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> if he goes, because I remember I used to take them in the way I used to go the, watch the goalkeeper as the goalkeeper would try to guess which, which way you, he's going, the, you want to kick it. Uh, so I would do the other way around. I would watch the goalkeeper before I kick it. When they move, I go to the opposite side. Or if they don't move, I pick one side, try to get a lot of pace, and, and, and I score. Um, when I say the best penalty is the one they go in, I remember in the World Cup against Ireland, wasn't my best penalty. He was holding, holding, holding. So I was holding, holding, holding. He didn't actually uh, uh, shake even. He didn't really actually dive. So he kind of, without moving much from the middle, kind of went. So I tried to go as as wide as possible, but because he was on my right side, the, the angle of my foot wasn't as big as I, I wanted to. So it went quite central. But I tried to put it on, on, on a bit of height, so it's, it's, you know, it's a bit more difficult, harder to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there nerves as you're running up? And if that's your strategy, it's to wait for the goalkeeper. And someone that I think does this quite a lot is Jorginho. Yeah. And the way he waits for the keeper to move yeah. before he takes the He always seems to just stroke it in. Yeah. But there must be such a mind game of who's going to go first. Uh, that yeah, especially if you know that's the way you take it. Yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. tension. But that, that routine you make before you take the penalty, that way is take away the tension. Or, well, it doesn't take it away, but it kind of camouflages it. So it makes it like secondary. You get the ball. You, where you put the ball, where you put the valve, or the Nike logo, or whatever it is that you do in your in your mind that you think is the best way for me to take the yeah, penalty. Yeah. The, the steps back, the angle you put your body in, whether you take more or, long, or, or uh, longer or shorter run, whether you, you, you're gonna make, you have to think, I'm gonna make a step over, I'm gonna wait until the last minute. So all those things take the sort of tension out, uh, which is something is recommend, well, I would advise to do once and I think it's very important. Otherwise, you're there like thinking, oh, why is it gonna go? Hundred thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. people, yeah. they're gonna kill me if I miss, I can't miss. <laughs> uh, what am I gonna do? You know, get to the dressing room. Oh, the ball, what do I do? What I put it? Maybe the ball moves, or the goalkeeper is like giving you a bit of talk, like, oh, you're gonna go there, like some of them they do. So if you don't have this sort of idea clear in your mind, then I think you're in big trouble. Do you think Pogba is brave to keep doing that run up that he does? Again, I think it comes with a self confidence. It's like with Ramos, when people say, Oh, he's not going to do another panenka. And he goes, like, Put another panenka. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the yeah. guts to do it. So I think Pogba is the same. When you are there against the goalkeeper and you know in your instinct and you got the confidence to say, I'm going to do it because I know it works. And, and that's, that's, that's the important thing. One day he's going to think, OK, today I change because for whatever reason, uh, I'm not confident of doing it. Again, that's, that's what for me is the, the most important thing, the confidence, knowing that whatever you do is going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose following on, and I, I, it's kind of a question of who would you have as your goalkeeper if you had to win that shootout, but also which goalkeepers, I, I mean, in your career, did you dislike coming up against when it was a penalty or would you dislike coming up against now in, in a penalty shootout? Uh, I mean, dislike, not, not dislike because psychologically, yeah, yeah. I mean, in those days, People already study the way you take penalties and etc. Um, but the way I, 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 I took them, I was on the on the driving seat because I was waiting for them. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. if you don't move, I go for one side. So in my case, I was very confident. Although obviously, I, I miss I think I missed two, but 
I was always very confident that whatever you do, I'm gonna beat you to it. Because if you don't move, I go one side. If you move, I go the other side. Uh, obviously, I think it was more intimidating when you had someone up front that it was very good at it. Uh, like I don't know, in my days Oliver Kahn or or De Gea nowadays. Or Valencia always had great goalkeepers. Uh, Reto. Or, um, in the way they, they the percentages, I think that's more intimidating for someone that it takes penalty than the actual momentum, uh, because it's, it's, it's a second, and whatever you decide to do, it's up to you and the goalkeeper. So if you go, I think it's more to have someone that is well known for saving penalties yeah. that actually might save yours. I mean, I, I always remember when I went back to play for Barca, play at Valen uh, Mestalla in Valencia, and Cañizales was the goalkeeper. So when I said I take the penalty, people was like, well, "Why is Cañizales?" He, he, Played with him like for so many years, he knows you so well. I said, Yeah, but so what? I know him well as well. Yeah, I know him as well, and I know what I'm doing. So I think psychologically, there's always this the way to, to pull it around. Can you tell me? I, I can't figure out why Messi struggles with penalties. He can take it past six players and score no problem, I know. but something is affecting it. What, yeah. what, what do you think the reason is? Well, I'll put it differently to what okay. you say. A player that he can, we recently saw him kicking the ball this. Throwing the bottle and putting it through the, the yeah, yeah, whatever, the ring, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. How can this guy not do that when he take a penalty? To say, okay, I'm gonna put it in the top corner any moment, any minute, any time. So why, why, or even Ronaldo, why they don't do these things? So that's when it comes to psychologically part of it. When, 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 for some reason they they don't score. I mean, I don't think there's words to describe it. How? So maybe. He kicks it wrongly, so he may rather than kick it in the ball like there, he kicks it maybe there. Um, the, the, the standing foot, maybe it's not so stable, whatever. Apart from that, there's no explanation for, yeah, it for be how so this easy. guy. Yes, yeah, so exactly. Yeah. But you, so I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to think. Do you think that. it's impossible that that's not on his mind now when he's stepping up to take a penalty? Everybody else seems to. I was at the Argentina Iceland game when he missed, and everyone expected him to miss for yeah. some reason. Do you think yeah, that would yeah, be in his mind? I mean, it's, no, I think it's normal in, in people, which, again, I think it gives an advantage to the goalkeeper, thinking that, oh, he's missed before. He's missed, a, not actually one, but missed a few. Um, in his mind, I don't think so. Just for the reason that I'm saying, because when you are there playing at that level, you you know what you're capable of, and you only stick to the positive thoughts that you have at that moment. And it's funny, because you started out by saying, you kind of wanted to pick Messi as one of your five penalty takers. Yeah, because it comes, again, same reason. But same with any technical at that level, like the best in the world uh, players. Why they don't do that? Why they go there and say, I put it here, there, whatever I want yeah, to yeah. put it. It's much easier than taking a run, like you know, like the crossbar challenge. You yeah. put it on the box, edge of the box. I'm sure out of five most good players would do that three times. Yeah. So why don't do that on the penalty? But there you are. Uh, as a final kind of thought, and as one of the all-time great penalty takers, would you have any words of advice for anyone listening who, who's taking penalties? Uh, you know, and and what what they might think when they're standing looking at that ball? What's the you know the things to get through? Well, your for head? me, which is what I learned, um, is what I said earlier about that routine. The routine from the moment you the penalty is given. Uh, I, I mean sometimes because of the controversy. Because a lot of players like uh, given that, so I would stay away from that. Uh, I always like to few step back, let do the argument, and then you join. Because I think if you in that sort of atmosphere, like can agitate you and mentally like distract you. Uh, but I think it's very important that routine thing uh, because that helps you focusing on what you have to do rather than what actually might happen if you don't do what you're doing. So from the moment you get the ball, from the moment. Uh, you, you put it, you place it, you take a step back, whatever you stand. So that comes with practice. So I'll obviously practice and, and keep in mind that. Those. Well, I feel like I've been educated. Sam, under Geiska's guidance, would you be confident taking in a penalty in a shootout now? <laughs> no. no. No? Still? <laughs> still don't back yourself? So basically, a Geiska, yeah, that was, a, that was a decent tutorial and it does illuminate uh, just how much preparation goes into these sorts of things, particularly for like a, like a Pogba run-up or a, a Hazard run-up. Like mm. They didn't just decide one day to do 40 steps before a penalty like on the spot. They've been practicing that for ages. So anyone who's going, oh, what's he doing? That's ridiculous. Like 
he's he's obviously practiced or this. Or the Jorginho step. Yeah, like that's something he's done. He's scored two penalties this season already using that. So yeah, didn't go well in the Carabao Cup final, but it's not like he just decided to do it and it went wrong. So it's good to see that there's so much prep or good to be reminded of that. But yeah, I don't. I, guys could, could work for a year with me on penalties, and I don't think I, I don't think I'd have the balls to take one. Um, I do take them in five aside at the end when we had when we settle it with a penalty shootout, and I'm two for two so far this season, haven't missed one. One step. But yeah, one step. But the goal is very wide, and the ball is very close to the goal, so I feel comfortable putting it in the corner from twelve yards. Yeah, I've always shied away from it. I've I've only had the opportunity to take one in a shootout, and I I decided to you go have none and, of it. Nah. Dean, have you ever been involved in a shootout? Well, I would have been, but I bottled it because um, what happened was I was about <laughs> 18. This is the only one that stands out. I've played in others, but I was about 18 and we were in the semi-final and I'd actually started the game as a sub. Obviously not happy about that. Um, brought on in the second half. Scored thinking no I'd have like kick. A, All right, Gareth. Bale, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I'll have some bail like anger to take out on this team. Anyway, played terribly. Missed two really good chances. Game goes into extra time and it's getting towards the end of the game. And I'm like, oh, it's going to go penalties. Like... Even though I was a forward, I just hated penalties. Went to penalty shootout. Um, deciding the five, I was like, nah, cut me out. So I wasn't one of the five. Of course, it's five all after the first five. Goes into sudden death. I'm like, nah, leave me out. Um, gets to eight all. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's the goalie like at penalties? Maybe he'll go ahead of me. <laughs> anyway, so I was going to be the 10th penalty taker because I'd lost all confidence in myself. Striker and in 10th. luckily... One of my teammates missed the penalty before. Not number nine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it was, I was almost, I was that desperate not to take a penalty that day. I wanted my mate to miss and he did. So we, we lost. Uh, some of the lads will actually be listening to this. So sorry, lads. I really didn't want to step up that day. <laughs> that is awful. That, that is, is terrible. terrible. Yeah, I, don't does, I don't mind taking pens. I don't mind taking pens. I didn't mind normally, but I was just shot. Just that day. Yeah. Just that day. Well, you need to spend some more time with guys, can mate, I think. Do, mate. Yeah, um, well, we are actually mates now on the back of that interview, so that's handy. Well, yeah. We also spoke to him about some of the players currently in La Liga that he'd love to have played with and also what the difference was between the Premier League and La Liga. Yeah, of course. I mean, as a midfielder, in the way I, I play the game and I, I understand the game, always looking at the players that have technically very good, good vision and, and you look I'd say most La Liga teams because you look obviously left alone the top ones uh, Madrid Barcelona Atletico Madrid you look at Betis the way they play even Levante they got very good midfielders Eibar uh, Girona they play always nice football so most teams nowadays they have maybe no high profile uh, names but very good technical uh, players yeah. uh, of course I would love to uh, Put me in that Barca shirt, and I would love to be with Rakitic, um, uh, Busi, Busquets, uh, Arthur, uh, Arthur. Uh, yeah, you name it. Uh, and he, Messi, and or even with Real Madrid, uh, Modric, uh, Casemiro. Casemiro, whoever. I mean, at that level of midfielder nowadays, uh, it's unbelievable. I think because the football is is, is becoming more technical. It's not. It's the importance of midfielders controlling the tempo of the games, controlling defending with the ball as well so by having possession it, it's, it's giving more role but only having there's no hardly any teams that have two holding midfielders now. yeah uh, nowadays that's very difficult yeah so you're someone that's played in, in both La Liga and the Premier League um, and this is something we ask you know reasonably regularly but what's the difference in, in, is, it, is it different when you move and, and adapting to that style and, and what are the kind of main main differences as a player from those two leagues I think now the gap is is, is closed down a little bit in the way the Premier League because more foreign play, uh, managers coming here and, and, and trying to manage more tactically and technically in the way we do in Spain or in the in the, in the, in the clubs in Spain. Uh, but the first things I noticed when I came it was there wasn't as tactical as Spain was in the way games were more uh, up and down. So it was a lot of fun in the way a foreign attacking uh, too, player. Yeah. Of course, you had. Chances from minute one to minute ninety-four. A throwing could be end up in a corner. Where in in Spain, because it was more control in the way you have more the ball, you, you like to be a bit more um, organized attacking. Those things were more difficult. So you you enjoy in a different way. In one having more the ball, and in the other one in the Premier League more about 
being prepared for the next chance because it could come at any, any minute. So, and yeah, probably more physical. The Premier League was more physical that, than La Liga was in terms of contact and, and intensity. Well, thank you so much to Geisker for his time and his expertise. And thank you to Liga Zone for making that interview possible. What an absolute gentleman, Dean. He was actually top man. Yeah, weirdly, though, he's like the same size as me, really small frame. And I'm like, how did you play at that level for that long? Like, I get bullied all over the place. You'll see the picture of me, Dean, and Geisker, and we're all pretty much the same height and the same build, and it's all really very pleasant. I was disappointed to miss out on the interview until I saw the photo and realised that I would have ruined it. Yeah, you would have ruined and the I, aesthetic. Yeah, and Plus I thought, invited, I, mate. probably, yeah, probably for the best. <laughs> That I skipped that one. <laughs> well, we'll be back with Bleacher Roulette and Sam's Nonsense Rankings after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to BR Football Ranks. You know what time it is. It's roulette time. Dean, let's get it started. Spin the wheel. Love this time of the week. Okay, would you rather win the Ballon d'Or or win the World Cup without stepping onto the pitch? Why can I not step on the pitch? I think, like, without playing a minute yeah. is the point. Well, why would I want that? <laughs> because you don't want to bring joy to your country, or no, I don't want that. You I want to win the Ballon d'Or. You'd win the Ballon d'Or. Yeah. You want you want the Ballon d'Or over the World Cup title? Yeah, because I'm not playing. I'd rather have the Ballon d'Or. You've been playing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I appreciate that. You get to play uh, all year on the uh, the World Cup. You, you've made the World Cup squad, but you haven't played. So you're like you're like Kim Pembe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'd be Kim Pembe. I'd be Kim Pembe. I would. As well. I no, would. I'm not into this at all. I would want. I would. The, the the feeling. The feeling of winning the World Cup for the whole country, bringing that much joy to someone. If I was just any way involved in that and be able to take a World Cup medal, I would take that over the Ballon d'Or for sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm with Sam. I'm afraid. I, I I think that the the amount of joy you're bringing to a whole country by by doing. Ain't gonna that. happen to you. You're Irish. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it's about the same <laughs> chance you've got, mate. <laughs> so that's one thing. And um, we've, yeah, I, I'm with Sam. Like, I think also I'd be the, the main man in the celebrations. <laughs> I'd just be like, wee, <laughs> carrying the cup everywhere. And be like, why has he got it? He didn't play a minute. Mate, I wasn't <laughs> happy about being sub in that semi final. You saw how much it affected me. So I wouldn't even be joining in the celebrations if I wasn't involved. Lionel Messi in the, in the early Champions League final. Right, so, Sam, spin the wheel. Oh, Dean, selfish. I saw it coming as well. I knew what he'd pick. If someone let you use their time machine to attend one match in history, which game would you go for? That's a great question. That is a really, really good question. I think it can be like, it doesn't have to be that far back in the past, does it? Like, it can just be like something you missed. Yeah. 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 (laughs) It doesn't have to be like the 1966 World Cup final. That was the the first game that came to memory. Yeah. I don't Um, really want to go to that one. No, surely the football's rubbish. Yeah. Why don't you, so is that the only reason? Because it wouldn't be a good spectacle. Yeah, I reckon there's been better games. So we found not surprised Dean doesn't want to go to that game because he'd rather win the Ballon d'Or than bring his country joy. Yeah. But I, uh, aligning it with my first answer, I would go to that game. Would I you? would like to experience that uh, because if that's what I'm striving to achieve in my first answer, then yeah. Uh, the, the, the feeling of winning the, the World Cup for a nation must be unbelievable. Wasn't I've, the same in those days. Yeah. I'm How do Dean. you know that? Oh, because it just obviously wasn't, obviously was wasn't. it? Well, in what didn't way have was Twitter, it? Obviously... Didn't have Instagram. <laughs> You wouldn't even be able to... Sh- no one even know you were there. What's was, the point? Yeah, it was better. Just tell people you were there. No one's going to know. I would also go to Wembley, though. I'd also go to old Wembley, and I would go to 1992 at Wembley, and I would watch Cruyff's Barcelona beat Sampdoria in the final of the Champions League. Um, mm-hmm. The kind of pinnacle of that first dream team under the greatest football mind that's ever walked the planet. Done. Done. <sighs> Easy. Simple. Uh, I would have gone to the 1999 Champions League final when Man United scored their two late goals um, to win the trophy. That must have been unbelievable. I actually was at the game when United won the league that year. I was at the game when they won the FA Cup that year. Um, my dad's a Man United fan, so that explains a lot of that. Um, obviously, wasn't going to take me to the Champions League final, which I was slightly disappointed about looking back. <laughs> but um, that would have been the game to be at out of those three for sure. Fair. Fair enough. Right, let's spin the wheel again. Would you rather earn one cap for your country or 50 caps for a country you feel no emotional attachment to? 50 caps for a country. (laughs) (laughs) In shock news, Dean Jones goes for the more cap option. Biggest mercenary in history, Dean Jones. Um, Thibaut Courtois and Dean Jones. Go on, Jack. Mine's one cap, absolutely. 100%. Yeah, it's one Uh, cap. Not even... Not even up for debate. 
Mine's 50 caps for someone else. <laughs> Dean's t- Trinidad and Tobago caps. Uh, that have you always meant the most to him. Mate, you wouldn't feel welcome in that dressing room. They'd be like, who's this chancer? <laughs> I'd be fine with being that one chancer uh, for one chance to put I on that be shirt. Part, I want to be one of the lads. I don't want to just be some, <laughs> some bloke on the side that gets to run out for 10 minutes. Melt. Oh. <laughs> 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 Sam, I don't know, man. One cut, one cut wonder is fine with me if it's if it's if it's the nation that I feel an affinity to. I don't want to go any further into the uh, how how you know how much do you uh, identify with a certain nation conversation. I think Jack Wilsh has covered that territory for us very well in the past. But the the country I feel an affinity for, one cap is fine. I couldn't do fifty for another. Right, fair enough. No enough. connections. <laughs> Dean has no loyalties, no <laughs> connections. Yeah. Next week we're going to see him on a different football podcast, and he'll actually, he won't even mention it to us. That's it, mate. Don't joke about that. I've had offers. <laughs> right. Well, you haven't had any offers like this, Sam. What's your nonsense <laughs> rankings? <laughs> okay, I'm um, going for. I've ranked my three most overrated sports. Okay. Oh, okay. I like that. And uh, Is football in there. <laughs> imagine imagine that this is uh, I think there are going to be some people that take real issue with this sort of thing uh, probably, outside, probably me outside yeah. of just you two I think yeah. everybody else will have an issue with it as well yeah. so we can start at number three and I'm going to group them all together as motorsports oh god I'm with you on that mate yeah um, and I'll go into one uh, well, not each one individually but two in particular I think uh, Formula One is interesting for approximately 15 seconds yeah the, the start yeah, and the, the end the first corner not normal not the end the yeah. first corner where most of them crash yeah from that point on, I don't care, and I'm led to believe it. It goes on for hours and hours after that first bend <laughs> as well. Belief. They do, they do more. They do at least like thirty or forty laps. It's thirty or forty laps. Isn't it like fifty or that. fifty or sixty laps? <laughs> yeah. it, the number just keeps going. The number is too high, whatever the number is. Okay, I, I can't say that I agree with this take at all. Like, but, I like Formula One, no, and also no. there's that hungover Sundays just watching Formula One on the TV, and it's really repetitive and and quite nice and and it's really not soothing. Boring. I, I like it. I'm it's a big crap. fan. Also, Max it, Verstappen is is amazing. I watch him all the time. Uh, the only reason I like watching those races is because some of the scenery in the background is quite pretty. <laughs> you two are guys, absolute philistines. Guys, like, guys it's, like, it's rubbish. And look, I, rubbish. I'm just going to uh, drop a little story here that I used to have a neighbor. This may be why I hate it so much, actually, looking back on it. I used to have a neighbor who was so obsessed with Formula One that he actually had car engine noises recorded onto a CD and he would play them on his CD player when we went round for dinner. <laughs> what, what a loser. <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> what? I just don't believe This is going in the did not happen in the year so awards. Is, it like, is, is he like that commentator true. who was like... Because <laughs> <laughs> that was good. That was good. That was, yeah, but did he do that at dinner? Uh, no, he never did it himself. He just put the noises on. <laughs> I but, will give you one but, thing about Formula One. He ended up divorced and moving to Wales to live alone. <laughs> and I w- I'm not saying that that's like... Linked. Justice, yeah. I am, but <laughs> I think he deserved oh, it. I'll, I'll give you one thing about Formula One: it's almost one hundred percent more entertaining to watch it on the television than to be at at the race. Oh yeah, no which interest. is which is you just it, see one something. bit of it every time. Well, don't yeah, you? That, that's what I was. Like. There is something about like you know on the TV at least you can see which you watch all the like drivers trying to overtake each other and things, and I, I do really enjoy it, but. I can't imagine going to the Formula One would be good crack. No, like, I imagine you're just sitting there like, wow, well, once every so often they just come around. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> so, so but, you know, what's anyway. even worse than Formula One? MotoGP, those idiots on bikes, <laughs> and anything in the US, like with the, with the they just do an oval circuit. <laughs> yeah, could, sorry, yeah. and, and NASCAR, what a waste of time. Yeah, to be like, fair, I'm so, with you on those. So, ones. so sometimes the MotoGP comes on my TV after the football's finished, yeah. and like I rarely move faster than to lunge for that remote. <laughs> it is an abomination. Anyway, that's we've only talked about one sport so far. Right, let's go, carry on. So here is the searing hot take that everybody will. will, will Will raise their I feel like up. people are going to disagree with that one to begin with. No, I th- I think basketball is hugely overrated. Yeah, no, this is an awful take. Yeah, I don't I, like this one. I, th- I I appreciate it's controversial, but let me just make yeah, my go. reasoning very yeah, yeah. clear. I believe that in sport scoring is should be really really difficult. It should be the ultimate goal, and it shouldn't happen as often as it does in basketball. They they score so much; it's so boring. Like oh yeah oh. Yeah, and again, yeah, oh, seven seconds later, they, yeah, they put it in that net. Oh, 15 seconds later, they put it in the other net. Like, it doesn't feel like an achievement to, to put the ball in the net. Like, they do it constantly. So highlights, right, alley-oops, dunks, buzzer beaters, long-range shots, three-pointers, fine. Highlights package, all good. Also, Space Jam, very good. No worries. No problem with Space Jam. But watching a full game of basketball, 
I will tune in for the last five minutes if the score is close. But often it's not. Often they're ahead by twenty, and what's that? What the hell is the yeah, point? It's not really the best to be part. fair. I, you know, I am. I'm a Celtics fan in bas- basketball, and they used to do this thing last year where they'd go into every fourth quarter about fifteen points down and somehow win, and it was honestly the most entertaining thing I've ever watched. And so I was cool. like, this is great. This yeah, is like, like last last quarter basketball, fine. Uh, you you can probably extend that to other sports as well if there's something on the line late on. But I do think you can miss those first forty five minutes and lose almost nothing outside of the two-minute highlight package. And All-Star Weekend's quite good. Look, there are some good bits, but... And there's also the whole thing where you follow the superstars and you, like, track their careers and stuff. Like, that's part of the sport. It's not so much, like, the... People will support teams based on where that player's joined. It's not the same yeah. affinity to a team that you have in, in our sport, is it? Well, Ronaldo fans and you... Messi fans do... Uh, Ronaldo exactly. fans, have been, fans have been and in that, and for a while. <laughs> that's pretty much coming from basketball, where they sell the NBA on the players rather than the teams. And, you know, LeBron and Steph Curry and what Kobe did, like, you can't knock that kind of stuff. That is proper entertainment. Like, you're wrong. I, yeah, appre- you're wrong I, I appreciate them. I like, like, monstrous athletes. Have Ex- you been to an NBA game? Extremely talented. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 all right, all right. Let's just move let's this on. one on. I think because we're not going to agree here. Go I think we're NBA about go. to agree so really num- badly. Num- number one is baseball. It oh, okay. baffles me that this is a sport that people watch, mm. and uh, it baffles me that people are paid so very much money to play it. Uh, incredible stuff. It is so boring. And I've been to a game. I got free tickets. Well, that's at least one step up on number two. Yeah. I've been to a game. I got free tickets. I left it halfway through, still feeling like it was a waste of money. It was that bad. Absolutely atrocious. Do you like cricket? No. Then that's fair enough. I don't like cricket either. But I am more into baseball because there's more that goes on around the game. Fireworks and stuff. There's fireworks. Yeah. There's like Got giveaways and t-shirt guns. Well, there's stuff around. But they know they have to do that because they know that you are. They are robbing you blind if they don't give you well, free you know, stuff. You get like it just takes pints, quite a long time. Big pints, like nothing you don't, happens. You can miss as much as you want. Though. That's yeah, what's yeah, fun. Yeah. Like when I go to like a Premier League game and you pop out for a beer and you miss a goal, it might be the only goal of the game and it's like probably a big moment to miss. And by the way, that happens to me all the time. Yeah, every week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but baseball, like you can go away, have a pint, have some pizza, walk around the whole stadium, come back. Probably haven't missed a lot. The problem I have with Quite that like is, it. yeah, you can use it as like a, you can use it as a day out to just have a drink or whatever, or, or just go and eat some food and stuff. But the prices are hiked up so badly that you're just paying like double the price for everything you should be paying. Yeah, I mean, if you don't like it, you definitely should. You're be You're trapped that. in an arena where you have to pay double for everything. You can't just say, "Oh, it's fine. I'll just have a bit of food and drink," because it would cost you through the nose. Yeah. I've got another anecdote here. Is that at my previous job in a call center, the guy that sat next. To me, called James, good guy. But every now and then, when we talk about what we do on our, our upcoming days off, he would often say, "Well, actually, I've got a day off on, say, Thursday, and uh, I've recorded about ten hours of baseball to get through. So I'll probably just sit there." And, oh my god! Like, really? Like, you've got to spend your day off doing that? He's like, "Yeah, I like stats." I was like, "Then just look at the stats." You don't need to watch the game. Sam, one of our biggest fans is Amy. I've told you about Amy in LA. Massive Dodgers fan. She listens to baseball on the radio. Uh, She'll go on vacation and she's watching their games on the beach, on a stream. I've seen the pictures. I've seen her in the car doing this. She would disagree strongly. And this might be the last podcast she ever listens to. She's a massive BR Football Ranks fan. So if we lose a listener, we are struggling. Okay, well, get her on a... (laughs) We'll get her her retort uh, on WhatsApp voice notes or something and we'll play it into into next week. I'd love love to hear the retort, to be fair, because I do feel like it's daylight robbery. Baseball fans are coming for you. All right, right. Well, I think think that's pretty much all we've got time for in nonsense (laughs) rankings. And I think that's probably all we've got time for in today's episode. If you've enjoyed it and you're not already, make sure that you're getting over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you use and make sure that you're subscribed. We like your ratings. We like your reviews. Make sure you're getting involved on all our social medias, on Twitter and Instagram with the hashtag BRFootballRanks or the hashtag Rank Squad. Basically, the, the top dogs in both of those now. So, <laughs> so thanks, for, uh, thanks for starting us off. Also, make sure that you are downloading the BR app. It's the best place for sports content on your phone, and it continually updates you with all the things that you want from the sporting world. So make sure you download that. We've been the Rank Squad. All I've got left to say is thank you to Sam Tai. Thank you. Thank you to Dean Jones. I've been Jack Collins. Rank squad out. See you next week.